What's up? Medite here. Let's now cover the internal structures of the cerebrum underneath the cerebral cortex. So the central nervous system consists of two parts, the encephalon and the spinal cord. The encephalon is then further divided into specific parts. We have the brainstem, which consists of the medulla, pons, and the midbrain, or the mesencephalon. We have the cerebellum back here, then the diencephalon and the telencephalon. Our focus in this video is going to be the telencephalon, which is the blue part here. But if we change this picture into a little more realistic one, we will find the spinal cord, the medulla, pons, and the cerebellum. And then the telencephalon would be this whole blue area right here. Let's now make a vertical section just like this, cut it, then look at the brain from this perspective. We will see this. So this is what we call a coronal section of the brain. And what we can see here is the pons and the midbrain, which are a part of the brainstem, and the diencephalon. The rest of the tissue here is what is referred to as the telencephalon, which is Latin for the cerebrum. When you look at the cerebrum, you will notice straight away that it consists of two hemispheres, so the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And each of these two hemispheres are divided into two specific parts, the pallium and the subpallium. The pallium is sort of the two outermost layers of the brain, which are the cerebral cortex, on the surface here filled with nerve cell bodies, and the white matter that is just underneath the cerebral cortex, formed by myelinated axons. The subpallium consists of what we call the basal ganglia, which are nuclei located in the deep white matter of the telencephalon. So again, in this video, we're going to focus on the white matter of the brain and the deep grey matter structures, the basal ganglia. So in this video, we're first going to look at the three types of fibers that make up the white matter of the brain, which are the association fibers, the commercial fibers, and the projection fibers. After that, we will cover the actual anatomy of the basal ganglia. In our last video, we covered the anatomy of the cerebral cortex, so go ahead and watch that if you haven't, because I highly recommend you to have an understanding of the cerebral cortex before understanding what's underneath it. Alright, so the cerebral white matter is classified, or divided, into three types of fibers. The first one is the association fibers. These fibers connect different structures within the same hemisphere. We have something called commissural fibers that cross over to the other side and connect structures of one hemisphere with the other, so the right hemisphere connects with the left hemisphere and vice versa. And then we have projection fibers. These are fibers that project downwards and upwards from or to the cerebral cortex through the brainstem and the spinal cord. So these are the three fibers we're going to focus on, and we will start with the association fibers. These fibers, as we said, connect structures within the same hemisphere. So let's go ahead and look at the side view of the brain so that we get a better overview of these fibers. So the association fibers are divided into two types. These are short association fibers and long association fibers. The short association fibers consist of arcuate fibers. And as you see here, they connect neighboring gyri or areas together. So they're short, as you see here. They form this U shape. That's why in some sources, you might see the arcuate fibers being referred to as U-fibers. So that was the only short association fibers we have in the white matter. Long association fibers consist of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. These fibers connect the frontal lobe with the occipital and the temporal lobe. Then we have the inferior longitudinal fasciculus that passes the lower surface of each hemisphere and connect the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe together. After that, we have the uncinate fasciculus, which passes along the bottom of the lateral sulcus, as you see here, and connect the frontal lobe with the temporal lobe. Then we have the cingulum, and the cingulum is best seen if we look at the medial surface of the hemisphere. So here in blue, we have the frontal lobe, and behind that, you see the parietal lobe. And under here, we have the cingulate gyrus. The cingulate gyrus is considered a part of the limbic system, because it works by transmitting fibers or signals. So the cingulum are fibers that go from the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe through the cingulate gyrus and eventually into the parahippocampal gyrus, as well as sending some fibers towards the temporal lobe as well. The cingulum is also a part of the Pepe circuit. Remember we talked about this one when we talked about the anterior nuclei of the thalamus? Pape's circuit is related to emotional episodic memory, so the cingulum has fibers circulating around in the subcortex to remind you about previous episodes you've had and connect it with the frontal lobe to trigger an emotional response to these previous memories. So that was the association fibers. Next, let's do the commercial fibers. 
Now, there are three ways fibers can cross over to the other hemisphere, or three structures that the associating fibers form as they pass over to the other side. And these are the corpus callosum, commissure of fornix, and the anterior commissure. So let's dig a little bit deeper into their anatomy. The corpus callosum is located here. So as fibers cross over to the other side, they form the corpus callosum. Now, the corpus callosum consists of different parts. So if we make a vertical section of the brain and then look at it from this perspective, we will see this. So what do we see here? We see the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. We can see the cuneus, which is the primary visual cortex. We can see the lateral occipital temporal gyrus and the medial occipital temporal gyrus. So these three are a part of the occipital lobe. Then we can see a part of the temporal lobe down here, the inferior temporal gyrus, and then here in blue is the parahippocampal gyrus, and then our cingulate gyrus here. Now underneath the cingulate gyrus, we'll find the corpus callosum. And now, just to orientate, you'll find the septum pellucidum right underneath it. This septum is a double fold of membrane that separates the lateral ventricles from each other, and it goes from the corpus callosum down to the fornix. Cool. Now that we have the orientation sorted, Let's focus on the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum has an arched shape, as you see here. The posterior end is the thickest part, and it's called the splenium. Anterior to it is the truncus. Then the forward bent part is genu. Genu means knee, since it looks like a bent knee. And it continues into a narrow part called the rostrum. So these are the parts of the corpus callosum. And again, these are fibers that go from one hemisphere to the other. But the fibers that go forward into the frontal lobe have a unique name. They're called the minor or frontal forceps, and the fibers that extend back towards the occipital lobe are called the major or occipital forceps. Now, if we go back here, what we really see here from this view is most probably the truncus of the corpus callosum. And when these fibers have crossed to the other side, they radiate spread to different parts of the cerebral cortex, forming the radiation of corpus callosum. So that was the corpus callosum. Awesome. Now, what was this thin stalk extending down from corpus callosum called? Do you remember we mentioned this earlier? This is called the septum pellucidum. That means that the structure underneath it is called the fornix. And the commercial of fornix is what connects the right side of the fornix with the left side of the fornix. But what is the fornix? So if you go back to this view, here's the septum pellucidum lying between the corpus callosum and the fornix. But here, you only see a tiny part of the fornix. If you continue backwards, you will see that the fornix look like this. One part goes to the right and one part goes to the left. And the commissural of fornix is what connects both sides together, as you see here. Now, if you hold the fornix and pull it out, you will see that it looks like this. So this whole thing is not really the fornix. The green part here is the hippocampus. And the two bulbs you see here are the mammillary bodies, but the rest that is not highlighted is the fornix. So the fornix, what it does is that it connects the hippocampus, which is where new memory and learning takes place, to other components of the limbic system, like the mammillary bodies. And the fornix consists of several parts. It consists of the cruise of the fornix, a body of fornix, and a column of fornix. And in between these two parts of the fornix, that is where you will find the commercial of fornix. Awesome. So that was two out of three. The last one is the anterior commercial fibers, which are small bundles of white matter fibers that connect the two hemispheres together across the midline. And it lies here. This tiny little structure here in front of the column of the fornix and the third ventricle, this tiny structure is the anterior commercial fiber. So that was the commercial fibers as well. Next, let's do the projection fibers. Projection fibers are ascending and descending tracts, so they're sensory and motor fibers connecting different parts of the cerebral hemispheres with all structures under the cortex. And all the fibers that go from and to the cerebral cortex have to go through a structure called the internal capsule, which is located here. Now from this view, we can't really have a full overview of the internal capsule. So if you go back to this view and make a transverse cut just like this, and then remove the upper portion, and then look at the brain from this perspective, we will see this. So what are the structures we see here? We see the thalamus of the diencephalon, we see the caudate nucleus, which is a part of the basal ganglia, we see the putamen and the globus pallidus externus and internus, which are also a part of the basal ganglia. 
From this view, we can see the lateral ventricle, which extends all the way to the back. We can see the septum pellucidum here in the midline. And in the front here, we can see the corpus callosum. The internal capsule is located right about here. So it has the thalamus and the caudate nucleus on the medial side, and the putamen and the globus pallidus externus and internus on the lateral side. And again, the fibers that go from the cerebral cortex and down, and the fibers that go upwards to the cerebral cortex, all go through the internal capsule. It's kind of like the highway for all the fibers going to or from the cortex. And it consists of three parts. It consists of the anterior limb, or crus anterius. It consists of the genu, which means knee and a posterior limb, or crus posterius. Each part of the internal capsule has different tracts that go through it. So the anterior limb has a tract called the frontopontin tract going through it. And remember, the frontopontin tract is one of the corticopontin tracts. So this tract comes from the frontal lobe, it goes down through the anterior limb of the internal capsule, and then synapse with the pontin nuclei of pons. From here, it goes to the cerebellum as the ponto cerebellar tract, then it goes up from the cerebellum to the red nucleus as the cerebello rubral tract, and then from the red nucleus, fibers either go to the thalamus or down as a rubrospinal tract. These are extrapyramidal tract that supports voluntary muscle movements. So that's mostly the only tract I wanted to mention that goes through the anterior limb. The tract that goes through the genu is the corticonuclear tract, and this tract goes from the primary motor cortex and then synapse with the cranial nuclei at the brainstem for the voluntary control of muscles located in the head and neck. So that is the tract that goes through genu. The posterior limb is the limb that has the most tracts going through it. One of them is the corticospinal tract. The corticospinal tract originates from the pyramidal cells of the primary motor area, and since they come from the pyramidal cells, we call this a pyramidal motor tract that descend down to the spinal cord to innervate skeletal muscles for voluntary muscle control. So that's this one. Now, do you remember when we went through the nuclei of the thalamus? There are tracts that go from the nuclei within the thalamus to the cortex through the posterior limb. And these nuclei are specifically the ventroposterior lateral and the ventroposterior medial nuclei. The tracts that are associated with the ventroposterior lateral nucleus are sensory information for the trunk and limb through the gracile fascicle and the cuneate fascicle, and they're responsible for the epicritic sensibility, which is proprioception and mechanoreceptors like touch and vibration. They will ascend as the medial lemniscus and then go to the ventroposterior lateral nucleus. Another tract it receives input from is the spinothalamic tract. And remember, this tract is responsible for sensation in regards to pain, temperature, pressure, and touch. So that is these. The other nucleus, the ventroposterior medial nucleus, or abbreviated as VPM, this is a sensory nucleus, and it receives sensory information from the face as well as gustation, or sense of taste. It receives its senses from the trigeminal nerve through the trigeminal lemniscus about proprioception, pain, touch, and all those things in the facial region. So that is this one. The other one is gustation, or taste. You know there are specific cranial nerves responsible for the sense of taste. These are the facial, grossopharyngeal, and the vagus nerve. So all of them will go to the ventroposterior medial nucleus. And now the tracts that go to the ventroposterior lateral and the ventroposterior medial will go through the posterior limb and then synapse with the different cortical regions in the brain. And these fibers that go from the thalamus to the cortex are called the thalamocortico fibers. So that's these. Now, from the lobes of the cerebrum, there are fibers that go from the temporal lobe, there are fibers that go from the parietal lobe, and there are fibers that go from the occipital lobe. And these fibers will go through the posterior limb of the internal capsule. These tracts are called the temporopontin tract, the parietopontin tract, and the occipitopontin tract. And they are very similar to the frontopontin tract we talked about earlier, the uh, tract that went through the anterior limb. And that is because all of these tracts, the temporopontin, occipitopontin, parietopontin, and the frontopontin tract, are called the corticopontin tract. And they're extrapyramidal tract that help voluntary movement become more precise. And the frontopontin tract is the only one of these that go through the anterior limb. And so these tracts will have the same loop as the previous one. So they will synapse with the pontin nuclei of pons. Then they will go to the 
cerebellum as the frontal cerebellar tract, and then they will go up from the cerebellum to the red nucleus as the cerebellum rubral tract, and then from the red nucleus, fibers either go up to the thalamus or down as the rubrospinal tract. Cool. What else goes through the posterior limb? The visual fibers. So remember, within the retina of your eyes, you have receptors for the second cranial nerve, the optic nerve. The optic nerve fibers will go back and then half of the fibers will cross and form the optic chiasm. After that, they will synapse with the lateral geniculate bodies. From the lateral geniculate bodies, the fibers will go back to the occipital lobe where you will find the primary visual cortex. And whenever they go to the primary visual cortex, that is when you're consciously aware of the things you see around you. The fibers that go from the lateral geniculate body towards the occipital lobe are called the optic radiation. And these fibers will go through the posterior limb of the internal capsule before going to the occipital lobe. So that's that one. Then we have the auditory pathway. This pathway starts around the cochlea of the inner ear, which converts the sound into nerve signals through the hair cells. From here, these signals are sent through the cochlear nerve to the cochlear nuclei impans. These fibers will then cross to the other side and form the trapezoid body of pons. Then they will ascend as a lateral lemniscus to the inferior colliculi. Then through the brachium of the inferior colliculi, the axons will reach the medial geniculate body and then reach the primary auditory cortex, which is located at the superior temporal gyrus. And the fibers between the medial geniculate bodies and the primary auditory cortex are also going to go through the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And they're called the auditory radiations. So that was all the tracks for the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Just remember that the internal capsule is the control point that all the cortical fibers have to go through in order to go from or to the cerebral cortex. And all these tracts are what we call projection fibers. So now we've gone through the cerebral white matter, which are association fibers, commercial fibers and projection fibers. The last thing we need to talk about in this video are the deep gray matter of the cerebral cortex. And these are the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are structures that work together in order to help the voluntary movements. So let's go through all the structures that are considered a part of the basal ganglia. These are the caudate nucleus, putamen, and the globus pallidus externus and internus. These four structures are considered the main input and output nuclei of the basal ganglia. So they're called the principal nuclei, all of them. And sometimes you see the word striatum. And when you combine the caudate nucleus and the putamen, you get the striatum. And when you combine the putamen and the globus pallidus, you get the lentiform nucleus. Then there are other structures that are functionally connected with the basal ganglia. These are the thalamus, or specifically the ventral anterior and the ventral lateral nucleus of the thalamus, the uh, subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra. Then another structure that are part of the basal ganglia that are closely connected with the cerebral cortex is clausterum. Now, if you look at a side view of the brain again, and highlight the fornix and the hippocampus, at the end of the hippocampus, you'll find the amygdaloid body. This is a structure of the limbic system, but is also associated with the basal ganglia. So now let's go through the structures of the basal ganglia that are associated with the cerebral hemispheres. These are the caudate nucleus, putamen, globus pallidus, claustrum, and the amygdaloid body. But before doing that, we need to have kind of a basic understanding of what the overall function of the basal ganglia is. The basic motor function is coordinated by the cerebral cortex, right? Primarily the primary motor area. Whenever you decide to consciously move a limb, your primary motor cortex will send motor tracts along the spinal cord to engage muscles necessary to do so through the corticospinal tract. But in order for this motor plan to be able to go to the muscles, you need to kind of have a communication with the basal ganglia. So imagine for a second that we've combined all the basal ganglia structures into a purple bulb here. So the primary motor area has to communicate their motor plan with the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia take that motor plan and modify it in a particular way through the direct and indirect pathway and send it back to the cerebral cortex to send now the proper motor plan to either start movement, stop movement or modulate the movement. Beautiful. Now, if you remove one of the cerebral hemispheres except the basal ganglia and look at them all from this perspective, we will see this. 
So what we see here is that cingulate gyrus, which has the cingulum association fibers for the limbic system. We see the corpus callosum, which is a part of the commercial fibers. We see the septum pellucidum. We can see the hippocampus, which is associated with learning and memory, and is connected with the fornix. Then we see the caudate nucleus, which have this weird shape of a worm, and is connected with the putamen. So let's go ahead and focus on the anatomy of the caudate nucleus a little bit. The caudate nucleus consists of a thick head going towards the frontal lobe, and it has a body or a corpus within the parietal lobe, and it goes back as the tail. And as you see here, the caudate nucleus connects with the putamen. So if we look at them both from an anterior view, we will see this. So the caudate nucleus is here, the putamen is here, and medially we will see the globus pallidus externus and the globus pallidus internus. Medially to the globus pallidus internus, you can see the thalamus. So if we go back to this picture, now the location of these basal ganglia structures kind of makes sense, right? Now lateral to the putamen, you will find claustrum, and claustrum is a strip of grey matter situated between the putamen and the insular lobe of the brain. The function of the claustrum is that it connects the basal ganglia to different cortical areas of the brain. Alright, so that was everything I wanted to talk about in terms of the cerebral white matter and the deep grey matter. I really hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please put a like, share, comment, whatever you find convenient to you, and see you next time.